Hi, thank you for joining this Teletown Hall about sound money and gold-backed monetary reform in South Carolina. We'll be talking about uh, the uh, roots of sound money, why it's, an, why it's an important issue, and also talking about legislation in the General Assembly right now to let set citizens use gold and silver coins as legal tender in South Carolina. I'd like to uh, first introduce our speakers. Uh, but before I do that, uh, there's a survey question we would like you to take. Um, the question is, would you support gold as legal currency in South Carolina? And you can use your keypad to vote uh, one, vote yes, touching one, no, touching two, or for undecided, uh, hit three. Uh, also, throughout this call, anytime you can uh, ask a question and submit your question by pressing uh, star three. So again, we'd like you to take our survey before we get the call going. And the question is, Will you support gold as legal tender, legal currency in South Carolina? One for yes, two for no, three for undecided. Our speakers today are John Allison, former CEO of BB&T and current distinguished professor at Wake Forest Business School, and Sean Filer, chairman of American Principles Project, a policy organization based in Washington, D.C. in South Carolina that advances sound money and other conservative causes. I'd like to go ahead and uh, ask the survey question one more time before I let our two hosts give their presentation. Thanks, uh, first of all, to Senator Jim DeMint for giving the introduction to our call and for uh, doing, uh, introducing legislation in the U.S. Senate that will help South Carolinians use gold as money. Again, if you could hit uh, one, if you believe that South Carolinians should be able to use gold as money, two for no, or three for undecided, we'd appreciate you if you take that survey. I'll now uh, turn it over to John Allison, distinguished professor at Wake Forest University and former head of BB&T Bank, to talk about uh, sound money. Mr. Allison, go ahead. Thank you, Rich. I want to create a, some context for the sound money issue. There's a very important myth in the public arena today that's justifying the current administration's economic policies. And the myth is that the recent financial crisis and the ensuing Great Recession was caused by the deregulation of the banking industry and the greed and greed on Wall Street. First, the banking industry was not uh, deregulated, and greed on Wall Street is a continuum and was not a special characteristic that led to the crisis. In fact, the real causes of the financial crisis are government policy. We don't live in a free market in the United States. We live in a mixed economy. The mixture varies a lot by industry. The most regulated industries, the financial services industry, the banking industry, and that's where our big problems uh, occurred. The fundamental causes of the financial crisis and the problems we're still start, uh, uh, struggling with were two primary culprits. First, the, the Federal Reserve, and secondly, government housing policy, affordable housing or subprime lending policy is executed to, through two giant government-sponsored enterprises, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, that would never exist in a free market. Let me comment on the Federal Reserve because sound money is really about getting rid of the Federal Reserve. Uh, the Federal Reserve was created in 1913 um, under the theory that it would reduce volatility in our economy. In practice, and there's strong economic evidence of this, the Federal Reserve reduces volatility in the short term and creates bigger problems in the long term. Why is that? In a free market, we're constantly making corrections. New businesses are being created, businesses are failing. What the Federal Reserve does is take out the downside of that correction process, which keeps, out, keeps resources from being allocated to more productive businesses and therefore pushes problems into the future. It would be very analogous to not disciplining a 15-year-old child. So the Federal Reserve helps in the short term but creates much bigger problems in the long term. Uh, more recently, leading to, the, leading to the financial crisis, Alan Greenspan, who was head of the Federal Reserve, uh, had a long career and he wanted to be a hero going out. We had a minor economic correction going on in the early 2000s, which we needed. He wanted to stop it, so he printed a bunch of money. He created what's called negative real interest rates, which incented a massive misinvestment in the economy. The misinvestment ended up in the housing market because of the government subprime lending affordable housing uh, uh, policies is executed through Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae 
uh, which when they failed owed five and a half trillion dollars and had two trillion dollars worth of uh, subprime affordable housing uh, mortgages. So the Fed, in fact, over my 40-year banking career, has constantly made mistakes in the management uh, of the monetary policy that's created misinvestments in the economy. And the reason for that, the Fed is fundamentally a political organization. Uh, and their goal is low unemployment, not price stability, and, and it really tries to make politicians happy. And what that does, it means it constantly prints money and, and in that process encourages leverage in the economic system and encourages politicians to try to buy votes uh, by expanding the money supply while, what, instead of having to tax people for the programs that, that they are uh, they're supporting. One myth that people ought to understand is the justification of the Federal Reserve is often given that we had a lot of chaos in our economy before there was a Federal Reserve. That's not true. From 1870 to 1913, there was no central bank in the United States. We had a private banking system, and the private banks operated on a gold standard. During that period of time, we did have some economic corrections, but they all were short. They were deep in some cases, but they were very short, and the economy started recovering again. In fact, we had the best economic growth rate in the history of man, uh, and we integrated millions of immigrants from Europe who were the rejects from Europe into our economic system without a central bank. The Fed was actually created mostly to help the New York banks because if they had a go if the government could lend you money, that would give you a competitive advantage. And, and it really wasn't in the business that it's in today when it was it was created. Uh, the last step in the in in creating fiat money was in 1971 when Richard Nixon detach the dollar from the from gold standard altogether. And since then, we've been running a massive experiment where the governments can print all the money they want to, and we're taking on faith that that money will be valuable, and that's really a very risky experiment. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Allison. I'd like to invite uh, participants to hit star three to submit their questions uh, for Mr. Allison and about uh, his presentation. Uh, so star three to submit a question. Again, we'd like to have you take our survey too. And the question is, would you support gold as legal tender in South Carolina? Uh, one for no, yes, two for no, or three for undecided? Uh, right now, with the survey is running about five to one in favor. Uh, and now let's turn it over to Sean Filer, Chairman of American Principles Project, who has spoken uh, for at this cause uh, at numerous events and has led our organization, American Principles Project, in advancing this issue in states like South Carolina and Utah around the country. Uh, Sean Filer, go ahead. <clears throat> Rich, thank you. Uh, John's exactly right. Uh, the Federal Reserve creates bubbles and it helps finance our overgrown federal government. But the fundamental problem with our, I think even a deeper problem with our monetary system is it actually hurts the people it's supposed to help, uh, specifically the American worker. And this is you know, as, as John pointed out, this is deeply ironic because the entire reason for our system of flexible money is that it's supposed to be good for the American worker. You know, some of you will remember President Nixon's speech 40 years ago when he lashed out against the speculators and broke America's last link with gold. That night he said, and I quote here, our primary concern is with the American worker and with fair competition around the world. Well, I don't think it would be too hard to convince anyone that President Nixon's, President Nixon's primary concern at that point was with his reelection, that going off the gold standard was going to give the economy a feel-good burst of easy money going into the election of 72. But let's take President Nixon's argument at its face value, because this is still the argument that is made today in defense of the current system, that flexible money is the best system for the American worker. Is that true? It certainly is hard to believe. After all, the employment prospects and real wages for the Ameri average American guy have deteriorated markedly over the last four decades. And this is true by almost any measure you want to pick. You look at the unemployment rate, the labor force participation, real wages, and in particular, the plight of workers who need the most help, those at the bottom of the uh, socioeconomic uh, ladder. When President Nixon was so worked up about the fate of the American worker, unemployment was only 
Now it's closer to nine. And the unemployment rate doesn't count for the increasing percentage of discouraged workers. For working aged men, we've seen the labor force participation fall over the last 40 years from 80% in 1971 to just 67% today. Moreover, for 40 years, the inflation adjusted wages of the average working guy have been flat. So when you factor in the reduction in the percentage of men working, you see a substantial multi-decade decline in the wages of the average guy. This is the first time this has happened in American history. And this reduction has not been voluntary, not even, and not evenly spread. The less well-educated have done worse, and those workers with just a high school education have been disproportionately hurt by a current system. As for fair competition, that's the second reason for our current system. Fair competition around the world, President Nixon said. The current system has been pretty much the opposite of fair for the average American worker. If this system's so fair, why do the Chinese and other countries hold down the value of their currency against the dollar? If this system's so fair, why do foreign central banks accumulate trillions of dollars of U.S. assets? Increasingly, Americans understand this is unfair, that we've got to change it, but not by starting a trade war, but by changing the system. Americans are also coming to understand that the current flexible money system is unfair in a much more fundamental way. Our system of constant low-level inflation has encouraged the middle class to mistake the mere appearance of price stability for actual price stability, a mistake in return for which the American middle class has received the appearance of progress without its substance. Put more concretely, the average American guy has lost ground over the past 40 years while his nominal wages have risen from $10,000 a year to $50,000 a year. And that's only if he's fortunate enough to still be employed. He might feel like he's making progress, but his real wages are going nowhere. And having gone backwards for decades, the American worker cannot change his career. He cannot change the sense that he's been deceived, that he was deprived of the one thing he needed the most, the truth, the one thing that would have allowed him to adjust to make the decisions necessary to compete in the global economy. Instead of the anesthetizing message of the Federal Reserve's easy money, Americans need clarity. They need to know that if they earn $50,000 a year, they're in the middle class. They can raise a family, drive two cars but not three, take one vacation but not two, and save $5,000. Now I want to talk to you about the solutions, <clears throat> the federal government, which depends on uh, the solutions to this problem. You know, the federal government, which depends upon easy money to finance itself, is not going to be the first mover forward on this, on this issue. Uh, the states are, and that's what I want to come back with after John um, uh, wraps up. Okay, and I'd like, thank you, Sean. I'd like to ask you to uh, submit questions if you have them at uh, star three. That's the uh, star three, we'll, you can let you ask your question and we'll get to them pretty soon. Also to take our uh, survey, we'd like you to answer the question, uh, would you support gold as legal tender in South Carolina? This pertains to H4128 in the uh, South Carolina Senate now that lets citizens use gold and silver coin as legal tender. And uh, to vote yes, is uh, one, to vote no is two, for, th for undecided is three. So please take our survey question on that. And I'd like to turn it back to uh, John Allison, professor at Wake Forest and former CEO of BB&T Bank to uh, make another presentation to you. Rich, I, I think it's important for people to be, get really clear about the really important role and purpose of money in the first place. Why do, why do we have money? It, it, it developed naturally without government involvement at all because people wanted to trade. And somebody would raise a cow, and they, they could theoretically trade that cow to somebody that made shoes, but it might take 100 shoes to equal one cow, and what would they do with 100 shoes? So it became far more efficient to have a standard so that we could trade one good against one standard product. Gold was selected over centuries. There were a hundred other alternatives, and silver was a, a, another alternative, because basically because it was hard to cheat. <laughs> you know, it's hard to yeah, it's hard to find. It, the, the, they can't print gold, and it was also malleable, and it was easily made into coins. But it was selected, and it served as a standard of value for five thousand years, basically until 1971, when it was finally totally kicked out by Richard Nixon. 
And the, so the market, not governments, had selected the standard of value. Why is the standard of value important? Well, if you're going to do economic calculation, you're going to create jobs for people, you're running a business, you got to be able to estimate what it's going to cost you to produce something and what your product's going to be worth in the future. It's like building a building. If a yard sticks 36 inches one day and then 45 inches uh, two weeks later and 25 inches you know, two years from now, how can you possibly build a building? And that's what the, the Federal Reserve, through the government control of the monetary system, does. They randomly change the length of the yard stick theoretically to manage the economy, but what they actually do is mismanage the economy. From the creation of the United States in 1783 until 1913, the creation of the Federal Reserve, the price level in the United States was basically flat. Now, the price of individual goods changed, but the price level did not change. There was no inflation. From the creation of the Federal Reserve till today, there's been over 2,000% inflation. And as was just described, what that does is it's actually designed to fool people <laughs> because you get more money and it's hard for you to realize that it's worth less. So you think you're better off at some level, but at another level, you, in reality, you figured out you aren't better off, but you're actually confused about what the change in value has has been. And, it, and that's particularly important to the federal government because they owe a lot of money. And if you owe a lot of money, if you can pay it back with cheaper dollars, then you kind of take advantage of the guy that provides you the financing for you, the, 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 the individuals that bought, uh, bought government bonds. That works for a while, but classically throughout history, when governments have issued currency and they've tried to cheat on the currency, at some point people lose confidence in the currency and the whole economic system collapses. The, the classic story of this was that after World War I, there was a republic created in Germany, and they printed money so much that people didn't trust it at all. It took a wheelbarrow to, to buy a loaf of money to buy a loaf of bread, and the whole economic system collapsed. And that is the, the, the risk you run when politicians can print money. And because of that, business people are less confident in economic calculation are less willing to take risks to create new uh, manufacturing plants, new uh, locations that create jobs. So the lack of confidence in the underlying dependability of the value of money leads to people being less willing to make longer-term investments for the future. Um, it, a, a lot of people don't understand that um, the Federal Reserve really totally controls our monetary system in the United States, that there really is no private banking system in the United States, that private banks are totally regulated by the Federal Reserve. They have to they use Federal Reserve currency. And, and what's being proposed here is a real alternative currency, a gold-based currency, which the belief is over time, I, and I, I strongly believe this, it, if you can get the right legal environment, will drive out the Federal Reserve notes because people won't have confidence in the Federal Reserve notes, whereas they will have confidence in a, in a currency that's based on gold that can't be manipulated. And, and it's not that gold is magical. It's that politicians can't print it. They, it's, it's very hard for politicians to cheat. <laughs> and and that's, that's why the market, private individuals in, 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 a, in a free exchange, chose gold as a standard of value uh, because it can't be cheated, and therefore we can have an honest exchange uh, that nobody can fudge on the transaction. Uh, unfortunately, politicians do fudge on the transaction, and they've been fudging in, in spades ever since the Federal Reserve was created. Thank you, John Allison, and I'd like to uh, invite all our participants to uh, ask questions uh, that we'll, our host will answer soon by dialing star three. Again, star three is for you to ask your questions on this topic, and uh, welcome other callers joining us uh, on this conversation about sound money and using gold as money in South Carolina, which relates to legislation in the state Senate now, uh, H. 4128, which just passed the House of Representatives, uh, that will let uh, South Carolinians use gold and silver coin uh, as money free of taxation. Uh, we have a survey question we'd like you to take. Um, 
that is um, about this idea. Uh, the question is, will you support gold as legal tender in South Carolina? Uh, for yes, hit one. For no, hit two. For three, hit undecided. And uh, the results right now are about six to one in favor of being able to use gold as legal tender in South Carolina. I'd like to turn it back over one more time to uh, our co-host, Sean Filer, who will uh, give another presentation on this topic, and then we'll get to your questions. Thanks, Rich. <clears throat> I want to close with the solution here. Uh, Article 1, Section 10 of the U.S. Constitution consists of a list of restrictions on state power. No state shall enter into a treaty or alliance with a foreign government. No state shall impose taxes on imports or exports. And it explicitly forbids states from issuing paper money in the following way. No state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. Today, this long dormant monetary power expressly reserved to the states is of particular significance because it offers states and their citizens a way out of Washington's money monopoly. By reasserting the legal tender status of gold in the state of South Carolina and removing state taxes on gold transactions, you will join Utah in taking an important first step back to sound money. I say first step because that's exactly what this is. Reintroducing gold as money state by state is just the first, albeit the most important, step in what will be a long march towards sound money. While I'm sympathetic with those who are fed up with Washington's easy money and big spending ways and want more immediate radical change, American history shows that real change happens gradually. Utah passed this legislation a year ago, and the people of Utah will tell you this legislation will not change much overnight. Let me explain why this legislation will not immediately allow gold to circulate as money in South Carolina. Even after Utah and South Carolina have recognized gold as money, the IRS will still recognize gold as a collectible and tax any change in its value against the dollar at a 28% rate. I'm sure you can all appreciate this unconstitutional federal tax, a tax which has not even been written into law, but is merely a matter of IRS interpretation, will prevent the free use of gold as money. But South Carolina and Utah will be joined by other states, and this momentum combined with the leadership of clear-eyed senators like Senator Jim DeMint, Senator Mike Lee in Utah, will usher in the changes necessary at the federal government to allow states to take up their constitutional right to use gold as money. Now, I don't want anyone asking <clears throat> if they're going to have to carry around gold coins. Thanks to the electronic payment system, no one has to. You can if you want, but no one's going to have to carry around gold coins to consummate a transaction. When you buy something with your card or check, gold instead of dollars would be debited from your account, just like when you go to Canada or anywhere abroad, and you buy things with your card denominated in Canadian dollars or whatever the foreign currency is, but you're paying effectively in U.S. dollars. Over time, this system will provide some much-needed competition to Washington's money monopoly, because people, when given a choice, as John makes clear, and this has been true for 5,000 years, when given a choice, will choose money that holds its value rather than money that constantly depreciates. And over time, this con competition from gold will force the federal government to give us a dollar as good as gold and stop its easy money, big spending ways, or it's going to have to cede market share to gold, the money that holds its value over time. Thank you, Sean Feiler. Um, to, uh, if you haven't submitted a question already, you can do that by hitting uh, star three. And uh, for either uh, APP Chairman Sean Feiler or John Allison, uh, we'll, we'll now get to our question and answer segment. And uh, we'll run through some questions which pertain to this topic. And thanks for everybody who has submitted a question so far. We're going to get to those now. Uh, the first one is for uh, Mr. Allison from William Tanner. And uh, we'll get William on the line if he can ask it now. Hello. William, are you there? I am. Please go ahead with your question uh, for Mr. Allison. Well, uh, I agree with, with what was stated uh, vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the history of the Federal Reserve and all of that. Um, and I'm almost convinced that we're past the point of no return. But uh, 
uh, what would be, if anything, uh, would be a replacement system? And you've partially answered my question in the previous narratives. But um, what would be, what would be the system that would be uh, uh, that would supplant or replace that in terms of uh, having some control over the over the economic aspects? Well, that's a great question, William. I, I think it's important. There have been massive advances in technology and how this would actually be implemented. We'll see. But, but here's the principle. For many years in the United States, we did not have a central bank. We had private banks. The way the private bank started is, is individuals put their money in the bank because they had confidence in the banker. And that money was gold, and the bank kept the gold in the vault, or you know, sto- stored it. And they, and you wrote checks on that, on those gold reserves. And that's exactly what would happen. Right now, banks have reserve. Private banks have have reserves with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve has gold. If you if you really went to a nationwide system, the gold would be redistributed to the banks, which own, or theoretically own it anyway, and, and that would be the basis on which the banks would issue, would allow individuals to issue checks in, from their checking accounts. There, there's a lot of good things that come out of that. One reason we had so many problems in our financial correction is banks were undercapitalized because the, a lot of bankers thought that if times went bad, the government would bail them out. In a private banking system, there's nobody to bail you out. <laughs> so the depositors are going to care, uh, even if there's some kind of private deposit insurance fund, and the banker's going to care, so they're going to keep very healthy reserves, and they're not going to take inordinate risk with other people's money. And and you shouldn't have that happen. In the, in the short term, that, that, that sounds like fun. <laughs> it creates a bubble. But in the long term, it's destructive because it's not a real increase in real production. But, but we did have a private banking system based on a gold standard that worked very, very well before there was a Federal Reserve. Uh, and, and, and essentially, all we have to do is go back to that system. And, and the first step, uh, if you, when you go into a national level, would be you make the dollar convertible to gold, and you move the gold to the banks that, that already have the reserves in the Federal Reserve, and then that's how they issue dollars. And you actually get competitive currencies, potentially, uh, uh, from different banks because the banks have to be healthy and are, are self-disciplined. That's exactly uh, what we had. Now, what's being proposed here, and I think is very important, if states were actually issuing gold coins <clears throat> the way they have the constitutional right to do and there was no tax implications, immediately there would be competition with the dollar. And people would have to say, well, you know, I don't know <laughs> whether I really trust these politicians to print the dollar versus having a, a solid sound coin here. <laughs> uh, and and uh, the, the theory, and I, I strongly believe this is true, that would at, at least impose discipline on the Federal Reserve uh, in terms of printing dollars. And in the long term, I believe it would basically, the Fed would either have to become a, a gold-based a sound money or it, it would go out of business because people wouldn't, wouldn't trust it. Um, and, and I don't really think the, con, the, the transition back to a private banking system is that hard, except most of the politicians don't want to do it. Because no matter what they say, they like to be able to run big deficits because they're buying votes <laughs> with that money. And the and the only if the U.S. couldn't let's say if the Fed, when the Fed was created, the United States government basically owed nothing. We had almost practically no debt. If we ha- if we had the big debt today, and the federal government couldn't print money, they would immediately have to balance the budget. There would be no option because the market wouldn't accept the debt level we have in the U.S. if the federal government couldn't print money. And and I happen to believe the only way to discipline Congress, whether Republicans or Democrats, the only way to discipline them is to take away the power to print money. And then the market will force the the the, the politicians to run balanced budget because they literally won't be able to borrow the money. Uh, the way they've been borrowing it, the, the rate they've been borrowing it. So that's a nice secondary but huge implication of what I believe is the only way to discipline Congress. Thank you, uh, John Allison. And uh, I want to go to a related question uh, that Rick Rabon has. We'll give to uh, APP Chairman Sean Filer here. 
uh, on uh, how debt has changed since we went off the gold standard. Uh, yeah, Rick, John, are you there? I, I am. I am. Thank you. Go ahead. I, I'm curious how our debt structure has changed since we went off the gold standard, our, our national debt. How has the how has the increase changed? And that, that's one side of it. And and I'm just curious if we've been in in, in, in this situation for so long. Why, and it's so detrimental. Why why aren't our politicians doing anything to change this? And, and I think maybe you've answered that question. The idea of of reelection becomes more important than the uh, fiscal responsibility of, of the country. Okay, Rick, let me, uh, let me uh, I think John, you know, hit on a lot of the answer to your second question there, so let me just briefly touch on that. And there's an enormous incentive structure for the federal government to maintain the current system because they depend upon the Federal Reserve for their runaway deficit spending. There's always somebody there willing to buy the bonds that the Treasury issues, and that's the Federal Reserve, and that allows this out-of-control spending. Now, the frontal assault approach, which is you just go in and we're going to elect enough politicians to overturn this system, I think is, is undoable. And that's what's so important about this legislation in South Carolina and this step. This is a, it's a very elegant way to get to the same uh, end point, uh, but starting relatively small. It would be analogous to um, instead of trying to hold a vote and run a political campaign to uh, close the post office um, to inventing email, you create a competition and that over time either you're going to get a lot more efficient post office or the post office is going to cede an enormous amount of market share to email. And so, um, you know, that's really uh, kind of the roadmap for how this, uh, this plays forward. With respect to debt, um, you know, I think it's right to concentrate on, on public debt. And we, you know, some, obviously, the, un, the unlimited ability of the federal government to issue bonds uh, is an important factor in the accumulation of federal debt. But also there's been a massive accumulation of private sector debt, in large part because of the very low and now even negative interest rates we have. Uh, if you look at the U.S. economy, we have 350% debt to GDP. That's all of the public and private debt aggregated together. Interest rates in America in real terms, so this is inflation adjusted, about negative 2%. So inflation runs at 2.5%. The short end of the yield curve, you're getting almost nothing. Uh, to go back to what would be historically normal um, under sound money of, say, let's say a 1% positive return if you save your money and you don't take any risk, that's a 300 basis point or 3% increase in the cost of debt across the yield curve. So that would be a 3% times 350% of GDP. That's more than a 10% annual drag on GDP if we go back to what 20 or 30 years ago would have been considered a normal real rate of interest. And so we've gotten in our, ourselves in this completely untenable situation because we have the flexibility to print money and because uh, the the politicized Fed has chosen to give us very uh, low and now even very negative real rates of interest. Thank you, Sean Feiler. Uh, before we get to the next question, I'd like to uh, first take the chance to thank the South Carolina Sound Money Committee. Uh, this is a committee uh, of activists, uh, Steve Isom, Ray Moore, Buddy Witherspoon, Patricia Wheat, Jackie Fowler, and Ned Toller are their leaders. And without this group, the South Carolina Sound Money Committee uh, we would not have this legislation uh, in the state Senate now already having passed the House of Representatives uh, to make gold and silver coin legal tender in the state. So it's thanks to their activism and their advocacy uh, that we have that bill there that has a chance of uh, passing and being signed by the governor this session. So thank you, South Carolina Sound Money Committee. Uh, also, if you haven't taken our poll, we would like you to do that. The poll question is, will you, will you support gold as legal tender in South Carolina? Uh, hit one for yes, two for no, or three for undecided. We'd still like you to take that survey if you haven't yet. Uh, let's go to a, uh, another question here. We have a uh, question um, from Stefan Moores, who uh, wants to know about uh, how your purchases would change uh, going on a gold-based monetary system. And uh, this is for Sean Filer. Stefan, are you there? Stefan? Yes, this is his wife. Hi. It was 
I was wondering about if if we go if South Carolina goes to the gold standard, and then my paycheck, let's say, comes in from headquarters in Plano, Texas. Does it go into my bank in South Carolina, and can I ask for it to be in gold and silver? And then also, if we don't make smaller coins, I understand the debit card when when you said you don't want people thinking they got to carry around gold and silver. But if you want us to move to that standard, then why wouldn't we have our own coins so that I can buy my groceries with gold and silver or cash based on standard, uh, but we're not supposed to have printed dollars. So I don't know. I just want to explain if we do it. And I, like I said, I understand the Weimar Republic. I understand the Federal Reserve. I understand all that. But in reality, how do we actually – do the transactions, and yet say that we're on the gold standard. What does that do to the average person? Okay, I think, I think the most important point to understand here is that as South Carolina passes this legislation and follows Utah, as a second state to pass this, South Carolinians will, on the day after this is enacted into law in South Carolina, be in the same position that uh, citizens of Utah are in today, which is that the federal regulation, federal taxation of all gold transactions, and the uh, federal impediments put into the banking system. And we were close to some individuals in Utah that have tried to set up uh, the back end plumbing to allow this to happen. And there have been numerous federal roadblocks put up in their path as they try to move forward with that. And so this is it's not a, a solution that will be available to South Carolinians the day after it's passed, but it's part of a state process to reassert um, their constitutional right, which will eventually result under uh, Romney or the next administration, hopefully enough political pressure so that we can uh, change the IRS's unconstitutional interpretation uh, of existing statute whereby they tax uh, gold and, and, and remove the hostility from the FDIC. From from the perspective of, yes, I mean, there's lots of, you know, how it works practically once it's permitted. You have a bank account. There's lots of countries in the world where you have a dual currency system, so you can take your paycheck and either uh, denominate it in gold or gold grams or denominate it in U.S. dollars, and then you go transact. I would suspect the actual price of everything that you would continue to transact in will be in dollars. And so it would only be the back-end plumbing, I think, initially, that would change and that your account would be debited in gold instead of in, in dollars. So you're, you're quite a way down the path in terms of um, how you'll actually use the gold money once you start talking about how to use gold or silver coin for small transactions. I don't think either gold or silver coin will be appropriate for small transactions. Either there will be some... Uh, paper or non-precious uh, metal currency that will be used for those transactions, or you can buy it via debit card or some other cashless currency. But that's the other point that's really important to make. And, you know, John, you know, as having run the 10th largest bank in America here and endorsing this, I think really speaks volumes to uh, the practical way in which our payment, our electronic payment system today can cope with this. Thank you, Sean. Uh, our next question uh, is for John Allison, and it comes from Nicholas Rotanto, who has a question about accountability in Washington. Uh, Nick, there. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Well, my question is, you know, with all the fiddling around that these people have done with our money, has anybody gotten fired over all, any of this kind of stuff? You know, we get, we get news constantly of, um, you know, federal uh, takeovers of of our auto industry, for instance, and, you know, uh, Solyndra with uh, $500 million or whatever it was in um, loans that, you know, they're defaulting on because they go bankrupt, uh, you know, these kind of things. I just keep on wondering, is anybody ever getting fired over any of this stuff? But then the, the second thing that I want to mention is this guy – previous to me had asked how we are going to, to you know, uh, use these coins or whatever. Do you realize that an ounce of gold is uh, right now, I think, sixteen or $1,700 um, an ounce, 
and one ounce in uh, of of weight, I can take I think it was uh, seven nickels and put it on a scale, and that equals one ounce. Now, how are you going to divide the sixteen hundred dollars and something, or seventeen hundred dollars, into one ounce pieces of money that people could actually carry around and spend? I mean, the the pieces would be so minuscule that they'd probably fall through the cracks in our pockets. And, you know, I mean, it just wouldn't make sense because the value of those kind of coins would be so high that, uh, you know, you, you'd only be able to, to do large transactions with extremely small coins. Thank you, Nicholas. So, so I'm, I'll, go ahead, John. So you got, let, let, let me answer those in reverse order first about the, the coins. First thing, when the, the real question is why is an ounce of gold worth sixteen hundred dollars, right? Then, you know, it wasn't long ago that an ounce of gold was worth thirty-two dollars. Uh, that's basically when Roosevelt uh, disconnected the dollar from gold. It's not because gold has gotten more valuable. It's because dollars have become radically less valuable. We printed a lot of dollars. Now, this, there's two solutions. One, you could simply revalue the dollar. So you got rid of a bunch of dollars. That actually is mechanically possible. Uh, and and so your $1 would be worth $10 or something. You could, And that happens. Countries do that all the time. It's not great, but that can be done. The more likely scenario uh, is what Sean was describing, is that you wouldn't really carry around gold coins. You'd either have a debit card or you might even still have paper money, but the paper money would be backed by gold. The bank would have to have gold in the vault so that if you wanted to get gold, you could get it, but you typically wouldn't use gold to go down to McDonald's and buy a hamburger. In fact, it'd be a lot easier today than it was in the 1800s because of the very major advances in technology. That's actually a very easily solvable problem. Your your original question about the accountability of government bureaucrats, the answer is they aren't accountable. <laughs> they don't get fired. <laughs> and certainly nobody at the Federal Reserve ever gets fired. Uh, and, and that's one of the problems. In fact, the problem is deeper than that. One reason there's a lot of support for the Federal Reserve is you don't hear attacks from the people that you would naturally think would attack the Federal Reserve. That would be academic economists who know the Fed does not work well. Why is that? The Federal Reserve employs the vast majority of academic economists in America. And if, and if they don't employ them, these economists work for universities and they get grants from the Federal Reserve to do research. Who is going to attack their own employer, right? So there are a lot of people uh, who understand these issues, know the damage the Federal Reserve has done to our economy, but are not going to be make the Federal Reserve mad because the Federal Reserve is who, who they get their jobs from. In addition, banks, I, I'm the retired uh, chairman and CEO of bb and banks are regulated by the Federal Reserve. They can make your life horrible <laughs> if you don't uh, make them happy. So it's very difficult for people to really speak their truth about the Federal Reserve. There's a lot of, of risk in doing that. Um, back to the fire question, one interest, this is a, a, a story. In the, in the early 1990s, there was a large insur government insurance pool called the FSLIC that insured the savings and loan industry. The savings and loan industry failed, and taxpayers lost $300 billion. It failed by one of the main reasons it failed. It was grossly mismanaged, or mis misregulated by the FSLIC, this government agency. Guess what happened to all the employees of the FSLIC? You'd think you know, maybe they'd go to jail or be fired. No. No, they got hired by the FDIC, <laughs> the other big government insurance pool, and I and I would encounter some of these people 10 and 15 years later that were still working for the FDIC, even though they had caused the taxpayers to lose $300 billion. Thank you, John Allison. Uh, our next question is going to be uh, from Ray Moore of the South Carolina Sound Money Committee. Uh, Ray, do, you have you, do we have you here? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear That's you. Great. Uh, have this could go for any of the three, uh, perhaps uh, John or Sean or even you, Rich. Sure. Uh, we worked hard, uh, the South Carolina Sound Money Committee, for probably around three years um, with this uh, 
H4128, and it was quite an effort to get it through the House, but it happened we passed it, six, it was passed 68 to 23, and it's been assigned to the Senate. But it went to a committee that we're not pleased about, the Finance Committee, where we think we'll have a less favorable reception. And we're really uh, desperate to try to get this bill passed in this session. We have about four weeks before the session ends. And I don't know if this is the right form or not, but we would like some ideas of how we can get it through the Senate with a, a committee that's not the, the chairman of the Finance Committee may not be sympathetic. And so we need a lot of uh, help, um, big people helping us, and maybe somebody like John Allison calling uh, the chairman of the committee. I don't know, but we really need some help to get it through the Senate, and that was what my question was. Ray, thank you. I'll uh, take that one, and uh, I would encourage all of our participants who are in favor of using gold as legal tender in South Carolina to contact their state senator and uh, ask that there be action on this bill. They can also contact the Senate leadership uh, and the, the Republicans in Senate leadership and um, uh, Senator Hugh Leatherman, who is chairman of the uh, Finance Committee where the bill currently resides. So we do encourage you to please contact your uh, legislator, your senator, to uh, ask for a vote on this bill. The uh, next question we have is uh, from Charles Williams, who has a question for Sean Filer on uh, other states uh, using gold as money. Uh, Mr. Williams, are you there? Yes, I am. So the question is whether or not any other states, and I guess part of that was answered earlier with Utah, that uses the gold standard, but is there any countries that are currently using the gold standard as well? Yeah, the, one of the uh, – so for the – um, more encouraging at the state level than it is um, globally, one of the restrictions that sovereign nations uh, subject themselves to by being members of the IMF is agreeing not to use gold as money. So, uh, so there is there is not another uh, example globally of uh, a country. Um, that has gone ahead with this. There, Malaysia uh, dabbled with this idea a decade or so ago when they were having their big fight with um, um, the IMF, um, but no state has done it. And really, America is unique, uh, unique in that um, Americans understand this principle of, of, of liberty and of uh, freedom in a way that's just different than the way it's understood in really the rest of the world. And the other thing that's very different about America is this Article 1, Section 10 of our Constitution, which gives us a way to start this process. Um, that's just something that is uh, unique um, globally, to the best of my knowledge. We do have a couple other states. So uh, Missouri has passed it in the House. And um, this, state, this, this legislation is kicked around and other forms of religious legislation have kicked around in committees um, in New Hampshire, in Montana, in Nevada over the last eight, nine years. But really the passage in Utah and now uh, the passage in the House in both South Carolina and Missouri, this is, this is very substantial progress. This is really a a breakout moment uh, for this issue politically here in the United States, and uh, we're going to need several states to do this to create the political momentum to get the changes necessary at the federal level to allow the state legislation to actually take effect and for states to be able to truly reassert their constitutional right. Thank you, Sean Feiler. Uh, I want to thank our uh, hosts on this call for uh, for educating uh, all of us about sound money and uh, the path forward in South Carolina and being able to use uh, gold, something that doesn't depreciate in value, as currency in the state. Uh, and I especially want to thank our two hosts, Sean Filer, who has led our organization, American Principles Project, in uh, being able to educate people around the country on this issue and to get political action on it. Uh, and to John Allison, who is, uh, through his role now as an educator and professor and a lecturer, and uh, from his experience, decades in banking and leading uh, one of the largest banks in the country, in speaking out on the, the need for uh, bold reform in monetary policy and getting back to uh, gold-backed money and gold as money in this country. So uh, thank you both to uh, Sean Filer and John Allison. 
for uh, educating us uh, in this Teletown Hall. Thank you, Rich. Yes, sir. Thank you, Rich. Okay, have a good evening, and we'll, you'll be hearing from us soon, hopefully, and we can do more of these. Thanks so much.